in for doctors uh, at that point. I know Pfizer and Moderna are, are, are asking for booster Dang. shots for normal people as well. So things are going to start changing a lot on all of that front once we get full approval for these vaccines. That's right. Yeah, Oscar, you're totally right on. And something I wanted to mention is that this might be the start of some serious change in our vaccination strategy and how public health thinks Come about on. vaccination. At the start of this year, we were just thankful to have vaccines, and we thought if we could get people fully vaccinated, if folks could get the two doses of the messenger RNA vaccines or one dose of the J&J vaccine, that would hold us firm. And what this pandemic and the Delta variant in particular have shown is that it really isn't enough, especially because not enough people got vaccinated. And so we're seeing the shift now where we're contemplating adding on a booster shot, not just for immunocompromised people, but for perhaps for the broader population. And then we're looking at full approval of these vaccines as opposed to just the authorization for emergency use, which is kind of a provisional designation. A lot of employers and the military have been waiting for a full approval before mandating vaccinations for their employees. So that could really have a big impact. And we could see a fairly serious change in how we approach vaccinations in a couple of weeks. John Rockoff, health business editor of the Wall Street Journal. Thank you very much for joining us. Thanks, Oscar. Take care. <laughs> this week, we also got some bad news about putting astronauts on the moon. Through its Artemis program, NASA was planning to send astronauts to the moon by 2024. According to a new report, that's not going to happen. Among other challenges, the spacesuits to be used to walk on the moon won't be ready until 2025. And even when they are completed, we will only have two flight-ready suits at a cost of over $1 billion. For more on all these massive delays, we'll speak to Christian Davenport, space reporter at the Washington Post. It's one of the most overlooked uh, parts of the program, right? When you think about going to the moon, you got to think about the rocket that's going to get get you there and uh, all the technical challenges of getting human beings off the surface of the Earth and all the way to the moon, some 240,000 miles away. You think about the spacecraft, you think about the landers and touching down. But overlooked are the spacesuits, which are vitally important because those spacesuits, just remember, think about uh, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin on the surface of the moon, those big, bulky spacesuits that protect the astronauts right. against radiation. There's cooling, there's heating, there's communication. They're almost like mini spaceships of their own out there in space. Obviously, the astronauts on the International Space Station, when they go out on spacewalk, wear them. And so they're really hard and they're really difficult. And what this report from the Inspector General shows is that NASA has really struggled with these and uh, there could be a significant delay in their plans to get back to the moon just because of the spacesuits themselves. They said that the spacesuits could cost more than one billion when all is said and done. And they're only gonna produce just two flight-ready spacesuits. <laughs> we we're only getting two. It's not like we're getting a whole pack of them, let's say. So I have to ask a simple question, obviously, and, and you kind of mentioned it a little bit, why can't we just use the old suits? It seems that they've hit their expiration date. That's it. I mean, the, the suits that they had are now, NASA says, like 25 years past their expected lifetime. So it's long overdue that NASA get new upgraded spacesuits. And they do want to improve a lot of the technology, allow them to have much more mobility, particularly in sort of, you know, the torso and the, the lower area. If you remember the NASA astronauts, they sort of bunny hopped on the lunar surface, and it's really hard for them to kneel and to pick up a rock, for example. They want to make it much easier and then let the astronauts be much more mobile, have better communication system, have better life support systems, even have, a, you know, sort of a Wi-Fi enabled spacesuit. You know, just sort of a next generation space suit, but this is a, a new effort, Artemis, to go to the moon, to, you know, follow on to Apollo, and they want that sort of next generation space suit to go along with it, but it's been very difficult. And yeah, the billion dollars, that's a lot of research and development and testing out. It does produce some test garments, some test space suits, including one demonstration space suit uh, that would be flown to the International Space Station and then worn there, plus the two flight ready suits that presumably would be used on the moon just continuing on with this. I mean, they need the new spacesuits. The Artemis program is not just a one-time moon mission. They're going to have some multiple missions and, you know, obviously beyond that. So they need to work on this. They've been working on them for 14 years, NASA has been, and they're doing this in-house. They're developing them in-house, but parts for the suits, they're using 27 different contractors 
really to put it all together. So there's a lot that goes into it, obviously. One of the uh, things I have to mention, because you can't really mention space without talking about Elon Musk and SpaceX right now. I think on Twitter he chimed in and said, hey, if SpaceX needs to step in and make the suit, you know, we can do that. And SpaceX is they're the ones who right now are the, the they provide the ride for NASA's astronauts to the International Space Station. And SpaceX has done three human spaceflight missions for NASA, getting the astronauts there. The spacesuits that the astronauts wear inside of SpaceX's Dragon spacecraft, a NASA's design. Now these are different spacesuits. I mean, you, you wouldn't go outside the spacecraft in these suits, but they are good for flight and they're they're pressurized, so they at least have some experience in this realm. Um, you know, at this point, I don't think NASA is going to take Elon up on his offer. They've already spent hundreds of millions of dollars on their own program and are well underway. But then again, you never know. Elon may just go off and build his own space. <laughs> right. So what does all this do to the Artemis program as a whole? Obviously, it's not good that the timetable is thrown off, but are there any other uh, things that can impact this negatively? I mean, I think NASA said themselves that a lot of this has to do with funding, obviously some pandemic bottlenecks, things like that, that's always the reason, but a lot of it has to do with funding. So delaying this a year, I mean, how much of, it, uh, of an impact is this really? Well, the fact of the matter is I don't think anyone who is following this closely actually thought that NASA was going to ever meet its 2024 deadline to return astronauts to the surface of the moon. That was just really a goal they had, but, you know, it was aspirational. It was to give the program a sense of urgency, but in reality, no one thought they were ever going to be able to make it. And what the space is, you know, these issues, it just sort of shows how difficult this is, how expensive it is, even though we had you know, done it before in the Apollo program in the 1960s. And it's yet another hurdle that NASA is going to have to overcome. I mean, they've had problems with their space launch system rocket. That's the NASA rocket that would hoist the Orion spacecraft to lunar orbit. The Orion spacecraft has had problems. In April, talking about Elon Musk and SpaceX, NASA awarded SpaceX a $3 billion contract to build the spacecraft that would actually take the astronauts to and from the lunar surface. That would get them down to the lunar surface. But Jeff Bezos of Blue Origin has filed a protest saying, oh no, that contract was awarded in error and that held things up for many months. And so it's moving ahead but it's moving ahead, you know, uh, you know, sort of in fits and starts, and the space suits are just another example of that. Christian Davenport, space reporter at the Washington Post and author of The Space Barons, thank you very much for joining us. Sure, thanks for having me. You're listening to The Daily Dive Weekend Edition on KFI AM 640 and everywhere in the iHeartRadio app. I'll be back with some more top stories from the week, but first, let's get an update from the KFI Newsroom. I'm Brian Bruman from the KFI 24-hour newsroom. Dodgers pitcher Trevor Bauer has defended himself against a new assault allegation. The Washington Post has reported Bauer received a temporary order of protection last year in Ohio for allegedly punching and choking a woman without consent during sex and later sending her a threatening text message. Bauer calls the new allegations baseless and accuses the woman of harassing and physically assaulting him and attempting to extort him for millions of dollars. Thunderstorms and high winds continue to cause problems for firefighters on the lines of the second largest fire in California history. Forecasters say unstable weather has whipped up winds and produced lightning as the flames move closer to a small lumber town in Sierra Nevada. Thousands of homes are threatened. The 500,000 acre fire destroyed the nearby town of Greenville a week ago. SoCal Weather from KFI brought to you by Wendy's. There's a heat advisory from 10 a.m. Sunday until 10 a.m. Monday in the San Fernando and Santa Clarita Valley. Highs will be in the low 90s to low 100. We lead local from the KFI 24-hour newsroom. I'm Brian Bruman. Checking KFI traffic, we do have a crash in Irvine on the 5 southbound at Bronco Parkway. That has only the carpool and the left lane open. Truck is backed up to the 133. In West Covina, on the 10 westbound from Sunset Avenue to Pacific, three right lanes coming off until 10 a.m. And to Riverside, 215 southbound of Martin Luther King Boulevard, carpool and left lane closed until 6 a.m. KFI in the sky helps get you there faster. I'm Jonathan White. Right now at Wendy's, get a Dave single plus another great item for just a buck more. It's Wendy's BOGO $1.
Limited time only. Price and participation may vary at U.S. Wendy's. Valid for item of equal or lesser value cannot be used in a combo or with other offer. Found the link. Eight two mortgage at the Fair Housing Lender. NMLS one six two six six nine nine. Well, it happened again. Mortgage rates dipped again. Chairman of the Fed hinted again about market uncertainty. The ten-year bond has fallen below one point two percent. The government has enacted a program, though, that gives homeowners relief on refinancing their homes this very minute. It's called Refi Now, and millions of homeowners are eligible. Even for the self-employed. You're going to want to call True Mortgage at 866-33-FASTER or go to truenow.com right now and see if you qualify for this government program. Here's the thing. It takes literally less than five minutes to see if you qualify. This program has one of the biggest government breaks regarding mortgage qualification guidelines ever. Credit requirements have been loosened by the federal government. Rates have been reduced even lower. And like we said, even for the self-employed. If you're a homeowner and missed out on the lowest rates or could not refi, this is your time. But do it today before the program program runs out. 833-66-FASTER or truenow.com. True Mortgage. 833-66-FASTER or dial pound 250 and say the keyword True Mortgage. Whether it's offering curbside or next day delivery for online orders on over 160,000 parts or getting involved in a local community, when it comes to serving you, Napa's motor never quits. That's Napa know-how. Find the employees you need to get your business moving. Sign up with iHeartAdBuilder.com and create a custom radio ad to reach job seekers listening to stations just like this one. Get started today at iHeartAdBuilder.com. There for a call strike. More goes down on strikes. It's a new career high of strikeouts for Julio Urias. Special event ticket packages. Combine the excitement of Dodger baseball with unique items that unite fans with a shared passion. Purchase a special event ticket package for Mexican Heritage Night on Tuesday, August 17th and receive a special Mexican Heritage Night jersey presented by Bank of America. To purchase, visit Dodgers.com slash ticket pack. Live and local. KFI AM 640. And iHeartRadio station. This is KFI AM 640 heard everywhere in the iHeartRadio app. I'm Oscar Ramirez, and you're listening to the Daily Dive Weekend Edition. This week, we also have another story of students taking on mountains of debt, only to have the high-paying jobs they were promised out of reach. Law school, which was once seen as a great path to a well-paying job, is the latest to be scrutinized as students often take out six-figure federal loans. Recent graduates of the University of Miami School of Law borrowed a median of $163,000. And two years later, half of them were only earning about $59,000 or less, making it difficult to pay down their loans. For more on how some law school students are killing themselves with debt, we'll speak to Andrea Fuller, reporter at The Wall Street Journal. First of all, I'll say that I think there's a popular misconception out there that you go to law school and you graduate and you make six figures. That's true for a certain subset of law school graduates. I think that's true very much at some of the top law schools in the country. What is true for more law school graduates at lower ranks, but even good law schools, is that you'll graduate making between forty-five and seventy-five thousand dollars a year, and only a sliver of the top students get access to those big firm jobs. Now, while I think a lot of people would consider seventy thousand dollars a year to be a pretty good salary for these lawyers. Some of them have $300,000 in student loans. And so what we're finding is that it's very difficult for people to pay back a $300,000 loan on that kind of salary. Okay, you mentioned in the article, starting lawyer salaries generally fall into two clusters. So about $45,000 mm -hmm. and $75,000 for public service and small firm attorneys. And if you're lucky, you know, you graduated from a big name school, all that, and you get placed in a large firm, you could make closer to 190000 So those are kind of the two categories there. For this story, you focus a lot on the University of Miami School of Law. The median that was borrowed for their students was 163000 And two years later, half of them were earning $60,000 or less. And uh, it was pretty tough for a lot of them to start repaying those loans. So Miami is a top 100 law school consistently in U.S. News and World Report rankings, which all law schools sort of, you know, they're Bible. But at the same time, of those top schools, it had the biggest gap between debt and earnings. So we wanted to look into Miami and figure out why that is. 
Now those salary figures, the 59,000, that is from graduates um, who graduated in about five years ago. So it's going to be a little bit higher now. But regardless, that's a big gap between the debt and the earnings. And a lot of these students, years ago when you went to school and you took out student loans, you were supposed to pay over the next 10 years. You paid off your student loans. Well, now that's been dragged up to 20 or 30 years. People are on these much, much longer payment plans, and they're enrolling in income-based repayment, which means that your payment is set according to your income. The problem is when you're on a plan that says you can pay less because you still earn that much, your interest continues to accumulate. So what we're seeing for even some of these lawyers is that their balances are growing and shrinking, and that's happening overwhelmingly for the recent Miami graduates. The simple question is, why are the students taking on so many loans? And it seems to center around two things. First, obviously, the tuition for these law schools have been going up year after year. That's one thing. The other part of it is this uh, grant plus loan program, where basically you can borrow up to the cost of tuition plus fees plus living expenses. So a lot of these uh, younger students who you know might not have as much experience with money, they're taking out the maximum loan possible, and a few years down the line, once they finish law school, boom, now they have this whatever it is, three hundred thousand dollars of debt. So yeah, there's a couple different things there, which is really. I think a lot of people who are so right me and say they should be part of those that they can look up the numbers. I think that there's a couple things at play here, which is one, law schools really market themselves. I mean, this is a business ultimately, and they're marketing themselves as, you know, they're not going to put your page just going to be so sad so, um, on the front of their brochure. Right, nobody would apply um, at that point. Right, and so, I mean, that's what one of the professors in our story says. He says, law well, schools engage in this kind of magical thinking in order to keep the lights on. Another issue is we're dealing with usually people who are 22, fresh out of college. In a lot of these cases, these are kids who, in fact, most of the people I talked to in my story were first-generation college students didn't have Why? families who were guiding them through the process. And, and I think there's this myth in our society of become a doctor or a lawyer and you're set. And so they go to law school and they take out $300,000 thinking wow. that it's going to be this wow. way to a new wow. life and it doesn't necessarily yield the kind of results that they were expecting. They don't realize quite how hard it is to pay off $300,000 in debt on a sub-six-figure salary. Law schools themselves, why are costs going up so much? I mean, what is it for them that they have to keep going? Is it uh, it's just money grabs? Is it just uh, the cost of operating? Well, I think it's a lot of time asking very soon to that. And Unfortunately, a lot of those numbers on multiple subjects and such are not public, so it's really hard to say definitively. What people told us, though, is that the cost of maintaining various law clinics has gone up, the cost of giving scholarships, which let me come back to, has gone up, and law schools also are expected to be revenue drivers for the university, maybe not as much as they were pre-recession, I'm talking about the 2007 to 9 recession, but they're still expected to contribute. Now the issue with scholarships I want to flag because law schools, they do give away a lot of scholarships and they're very public about this. The sort of wrinkle in that is that those are often merit-based scholarships. They go to students who they're trying to recruit because they have high LSAT scores, which will improve their, wait for it, U.S. News and World Report rankings. So ultimately, you see a lot of kids from lower income backgrounds who are the ones who are borrowing the most. You profiled one student, his name is Dylan. He went to University of Miami mm -hmm. Law School. You know, in the end, like right now, I think currently he owns about that. He owes about 300000 in debt. But tell me a little bit about his story, because he's finding trouble right now getting a loan for a home because his uh, debt load is too high. Correct, and I think this is something that people don't think about when they take on this debt, is how it affects your credit. So Dylan graduated um, about uh, five years ago from Miami, worked as a 
public defender for a couple of years, realized it's really hard to survive in Miami on a public defender salary, switched to the private sector, and he thought, okay, I'm making over $100,000 now, I'm set. But then he and his fiance went to the bank earlier this year, and they tried to get a loan, and they, they were limited in how much they could actually get approved for. And the reason was because his debt was too high, that his debt compared to his income was really out of whack. And that was just floored him because he, he said to me, you know, here I am, an attorney in the private sector making good money, and I can't get even approved to get a single family home. And I've talked to other wow. students, you know, for the story who, who weren't mentioned, but who said similar things, that they had trouble getting approved for credit card limits or getting approved, you know, that it affected their credit score. And the reason is, you know, this debt, as it accrues, especially as the interest accrues when you're not repaying principal, can really be harmful to you financially. You know, all of these stories are just kind of warning signs, you know, cautionary tales, right? These are worthwhile professions. If this is what you want to do, go for it. That's great. Get that loan if you need it. But you got to be smart on that debt load you're going to take and being able to pay it off later. You know, you're not going to – everybody doesn't get placed in these high-paying professions right away after. So, they, I mean, these are the cautionary tales you got to yeah. be careful for. Absolutely. I, I think that, you know, if you are going to a top law school and you know that you want to go that big law route and – you know, it's schooling, but you're ready to do it, you will make that big money. But if you are looking at other law schools, I talked to people for the story who said, oh my gosh, I turned down another school, you know, where I had a scholarship because Miami was more prestigious. It's important to weigh the financial consequences of a decision and to know about the salary ranges that you're going to see when you you graduate and to see how realistic the debt is to pay off. And I think that a lot of 22-year-olds don't necessarily think about those things. Andrea Fuller, reporter at The Wall Street Journal, thank you very much for joining us. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. You're listening to The Daily Dive Weekend Edition on KFI AM640. When we come back, we'll tell you about how many people took the time during the pandemic to say goodbye to aging tech. Hey, Gary, how are things? Things are great, but I crushed my mortgage payment with owning without even leaving my couch. I got a no-closing-cost refi at a great low rate, and owning did it all in less than three weeks. It was easy. No must, no fuss. Be like Gary. Call owning at 855-5-OWNING and crush your mortgage payment with today's 15-year fixed refi at 1.875% rated APR with no closing costs. None. Zero. Even if you've refinanced recently, call 855-5-OWNING and let us crush your monthly payment even more. That's 855-5-OWNING or log on to owning.com. MMLS 2611, licensed by the Department of Financial Protection and Innovation under the California Residential Mortgage Lending Act, subject to credit approval. Call 823-852-6464 for terms and conditions. You can crush it too with a 15-year fix, 1.875% rate in APR with absolutely no closing costs. Contractor license 1047-781. Imagine running a marathon in the desert in the summer. And this marathon doesn't have a finish line. In this marathon, you run to you drop. It's called the air conditioner marathon. In places like Minneapolis or Portland, or any of them other places where it don't get real hot, air conditioners can last 20 years or more. But down here where birds burst into flames in midair and fall down fully roasted from the skies, that. Yep. What are you doing? I'm helping people understand this ain't important. Here in the desert, air conditioners last about 11 years. But you don't have to spend money on a snowblower, or salt for that icy sidewalk, or windshield the ice for your car. Exactly. I don't think they need any of those things in Portland. Did I say Portland? I meant to say Minneapolis. A new AC from Ghetto will keep your home cooler and use a lot less energy. So if you think your AC might be about ready to go to air conditioner heaven, call Ghetto. G-O-E-T-T-L. We'll keep you cool, but it's hard to sell. Great. Subject to change without notice. Minimum loan amount requirements apply. 50% loan to value and 740 FICO credit score. Certain restrictions apply. Subject to credit approval. NMLS 3290. Loans made or arranged pursuant to a California Finance Lenders Law License number 6036970. Equal housing lender. Unbelievable. Home loan rates have dropped again at Intel alone. Today, Intel alone is offering a 1.875% rate in the APR 
with no points and no lender fees. Did you hear that? A 1.875%. Don't think you qualify? I bet you haven't called Intel alone. You don't have to have perfect credit to get this great home loan. So lock in this unbelievably low 1.875% fixed rate and APR with no points and no lender fees. So call Intel alone before the rates go up. Call them at 1-800-918-6200, that's 1-800-918-6200, or just go to IntelliLoan.com. IntelliLoan, borrow smart. Win your way to our 2021 iHeartRadio Music Festival, September 17th and 18th in Las Vegas, and win $1,000. You'll see Billie Eilish, Cheap Trick, Coldplay, Dua Lipa, Florida Georgia Line, J. Cole, Journey, Khalid, Lil Baby, Maroon 5, Nelly, Sam Hunt, Weezer, special guest performance by Phineas, and more on the T-Mobile Arena stage in Las Vegas. Listen every weekday to win your way there and win $1,000. Portions of the following program will be recorded. But anyway, the, the helicopter just flew over us and uh, shined the light in. And I can't tell by the helicopter who it is. Did it say on, on, on Twitter or who it was? No, he didn't tweet about it. Tim Lynn said it was me. Oh, it was Tim? Yeah. Oh, okay. That's I what I thought it was. It. Yeah. Yeah. Tim Lynn is a, a, you know, takes time out to uh, flash his friend. The Tim Conway Jr. Show. Who is it? Weekdays at 6 on KFI. KFI. AM 640. I know the weight of the world seems to rest on your shoulders, and sometimes life seems like it's filled only with confusion and chaos. But I assure you, I have a plan for you. The Jesus Christ Show. This morning at 6 on KFI AM 640. More stimulating talk. This is KFI AM 640, heard everywhere in the iHeartRadio app. I'm Oscar Ramirez, and you're listening to the Daily Dive Weekend Edition. Finally for this week, one of the main storylines we heard throughout the pandemic were households getting new puppies. Whether it was to combat loneliness or give the kids something to do, pandemic puppies were all the rage. But on the other side of things, many were already dealing with aging pets. And through the shutdowns and work from home setups, many took the time to say goodbye to beloved pets. For more on another perspective on pandemic pet life, we'll speak to Jorge Rivas, reporter at the Washington Post. We were just in the midst of losing our dog, Riley, and. And even on our street, on our block, we live in suburban Maryland, we had our neighbors getting puppies, you know, during this time. Like you mentioned, people being home and having more time. Wow. So our, we have three kids at home and our schools, you know, schools uh, went remote, all activities, feasts, um, sports and other things like that. My wife and I were both working from home and like a lot of our neighbors um, had time to spend. So we started seeing, you know, people getting puppies. Behind us, there was a puppy. I mentioned in the story, our, our good friends and neighbors that across the street from us got a new puppy as well. Um, but yeah, but we were home with, with our 13-year-old. Um, I guess she would have been around 12 then when, it, when the pandemic started. Boxer, who in normal situations, you know, um, we would leave the house for all day long. And, and we had a dog walker who would come once a day and let her out to, to go to the bathroom and take her on a short walk. But she was, she was home most of the day um, while we went to work and to school. And, uh, and being home, you know, there is a certain, a certain amount of, 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 of grace in getting that time with her of, of when other times we'd be too busy to spend. And we started noticing, like, you know, things that we were just too busy to do, especially during the weekdays, is, you know, going on walks through our neighborhood and bike rides and, and just little hikes that we found in the park and things that we were trying to do because we couldn't, you know, do the other things during the, the lockdown and during the pandemic. And we would take her with us. And, and it really was like this really nice way to, to spend time with, with, the, with, our, with our dog again. And, um, and then I talked to other people who had similar situations um, and reached out to, to, some, to some folks I found in, in Reddit communities where people had lost dogs and I talked to some grief counselors who put me in touch with, with people that, that were going through this, but almost everyone, you know, as, as sad as it was to lose a pet during time, um, felt grateful to have that time to be with them. And even if it was just, you know, like our dog wasn't, at that point in her life, wasn't, you know, actively running and we weren't doing a lot of things, but she was just there on the couch, you know, behind us while we were doing Zoom calls or our kids were on remote learning in school. And 
it just came with this routine of having her there, which felt very comforting. Right. And that's something that a lot of people we talk to also experience, or I talk to also experience. I mean, that's totally it, it right there, right? You, you go to work, you're not there for many hours a day, but when things get flipped upside down and they are there so long, that extra visibility, it means a little bit more. And, and obviously not to diminish anybody who lost a person, a family member throughout the pandemic, but a lot of time for pet lovers, you know, losing a pet is just yeah, different. Yeah, you know, it makes me reflect on different things somehow. So, it, it, yeah, I mean, I would definitely, I got to spend a lot more time with my dog. He's like one or two, I mean, he's two years old right now, so we had him when he was one. So he kind of was growing up through all this. But, uh, I, you know, I reading your story, I remember my old pup, you know, and, and when he was older and, and getting on his years and, and passing away and everything. And, yeah, it just really, it hits you differently a lot of times. So tell me about some of the stories that other people felt. Uh, you know, they felt, you know, the, the effect of what happens after, right? They pass away, and a lot of people said they felt untethered was a word that I pulled out from the article. They didn't know what to do anymore because, you know, that daily routine was gone now. Right, and, and so I talked to um, a, a grief counselor named Jessica Coral um, from Washington, D.C., and she, she used that term, and it was this feeling that one of the people I talked to, um, Megan McCormack, she was in Perth, Australia, and she lost her, her border terrier, Briarly. And just this feeling of not, you get in your routine, right? And, and, and you know, whether it's, it's letting the dog out in the morning and, and feeding, the, feeding the dog and going on a walk, and feeling that, um, and Coral described this feeling of, of not knowing what to do with yourself when that presence is there. Um, and it was heightened by just being home all the time, you know? and and not having something to sort of distract us from that grief. Um, in another situation, you know, you may lose a pet, but you still have to go to work, you still have to go to school, you still have to get the kids ready to go to school or do something else. But, but here you were just home, and that daily routine of, of, of spending time with your dog sort of made you feel like you weren't really sure what to do. And, um, you know, for... For um, one of the people I talked to, Julia Lenicky, who's a, a stock clerk uh, for free retailer tailor in, in, in Germany, mentioned that, that she kept looking. She'd come down and kept looking. Um, she had her dog, Yuna, die, and she kept looking for the dog to be there. And I, I, you know, I felt that sort of, too, and my wife and I talked about it, too, where our dog had this, um, Riley had this, this sort of a tick she would do. Um, she couldn't walk up our stairs, so she'd wake up in the morning and kind of go to the end of the stairs and shake her head. And you hear this like flopping of the ears. Um, it was almost like an alarm clock. And I knew like, get, one of us had to get up and let her outside to, to go outside. And, and you didn't hear that. And it was, it was weird, you know, and your, your brain was almost like used to that and, and that sound. And um, yeah, and so you kind of like, because we were just so, you know, for us at least, we were just so tethered to our home that, you know, that feeling of not having that around us was, was sort of untethered. Um, and, and you also mentioned before, like, right, like, you know, the, the people have lost loved ones, you know, it, and so many people have lost so much during this pandemic. So this isn't a story to, to, to kind of compare these two. But one of the, one of the um, Greek counselors I talked to, Khalil uh, Sakakini, mentioned how that, that, that a, a death of a pet almost heightened this this feeling of grief that we've all had through this pandemic so for some people he some of the, the clients he talked to they may have had another love a, a, a human loved one pass and the death of the pet sort of brought about all these feelings that they had been kind of holding on to um throughout the pandemic and, and he saw that a lot with the clients he talked to yeah i mean i enjoy many stories about pets and, and I saw the headline that you had for, for your article and I knew right away it was something I want to talk about as, as you mentioned you know not to diminish anything else this is but this is um, some perspective right on the other right. side of things that were happening throughout the pandemic as we mentioned at the beginning pandemic puppies it was a huge boom for the pet industry all that stuff but this is uh, the other how pets were affected how we were affected through a lot of those closures and stuff. And, and that, that is that other flip side, you know. People went through this also in their loneliness and their isolation and the craziness of kids being at home. This was the other stuff. And, and uh, I, you know, I, I, I have to say, I, I really felt the emotion <laughs> in your writing yeah. when you were talking about yeah. Riley a lot. It, you know, it, it means something to kind of connect with that because a lot of people go through that same thing. 
Yeah, I mean, people were home, you know, and, and we were home with our pets, and, and that was one thing that in, in a lot of the people I talked with, and especially people that were that were home alone, right? That were that were that you know, were, their pets became their companion through this really difficult time that we've all experienced, and that companionship you had with them. I mean, we, we have it, you know, it's structured in this story around dogs because this is our dog issue, but it, it you know, we talked about other pets as well with some of, some of the folks I talked to, cats, a bird, you know, people felt this a very strong connection just because they were home so much and with them. And, and right, it just, pandemic sort of heightened these losses, but at the same time, like you said, like, it, it, mm -hmm. there's a great, you know, having this, great, grateful for the time that you had to spend with this, with this important being in your life. It's a really great story, a very personal story. I suggest everybody go out and check it out, uh, read it, and then you can find out, the, you know, what happened to Riley and all that stuff. But just a, a, a great look into all of this. Jorge Rivas, reporter and video journalist at the Washington Post, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for tuning in to the Daily Dive Weekend Edition. You can catch a fresh episode of the podcast every morning, Monday through Friday on iHeartRadio. You can also follow us on social media at Daily Dive Pod on both Twitter and Instagram. Stay tuned for the Jesus Christ Show next. But first, into the newsroom. This is KFI AM 640, for more stimulating talk. Not just stimulating talk, it's more. KFI. KOST HD2. Los Angeles, Orange County. Live everywhere on the IR Radio app. U.S. Embassy evacuated. I'm Layla Muhammad. Live from the KFI 24 hour newsroom. The Taliban has entered the capital city of Kabul in Afghanistan. ABC's Ian Pinnell says the Taliban and the Afghan government are reportedly in negotiations for a peaceful transfer of power. Now, the Taliban have issued orders saying their fighters will not enter the city, although we've certainly seen reports of some fighters around there. We've seen people waving white flags and some fleet abandoning posts. People are trying to get out of the country to safety. The U.S. has sent troops to help with that situation. Uh, the U.S. Embassy has been evacuated. The AP is reporting that Afghan officials have given Bagram Air Base to the Taliban. That base is home to a prison housing 5,000 inmates. A car has slammed into a big red truck on the 5 freeway in Newhall. The two people inside the car were killed. The CHP says those two were decapitated when their car crashed into that truck and under it. People who are construction will make it tougher to get around LAX for a while. Up to six lanes of Century Boulevard near the airport will be closed starting tomorrow for construction of the automated people mover train guideway, which will run over the roadway. Construction between Avion Drive and Sepulveda Boulevard will cause delays from 9 to 3.30 weekdays and from 8 to 6 on Saturdays through August 30th. The People Mover Project will have six stations, three at the terminal and three outside the terminal area, which will then connect oh, to the car right. right. rental facility. The $14.5 million project is scheduled to open in 2023. Amy King, KFI News. More than 300 people have been killed in a major earthquake in Haiti. ABC's Christine Sloan says nearly 2,000 other people were hurt in that 7.2 earthquake yesterday. There are concerns Haiti could be facing the same level of devastating destruction seen after an earthquake shattered the country 11 years ago, killing more than 200,000. And now Haiti is facing the threat of another natural disaster as climate reform drift has towards the island. Travel to some grace is predicted to reach Haiti late oh. tomorrow. Tuesday, the U.S. Geological Survey says the quake was centered about 80 miles west of the capital of Port-au-Prince. A wind at Indianapolis has removed willpower from Roger Pinsky's doghouse. Oh, yeah, really, really stoked, and I can speak to him now. I avoided him after last week, so <laughs> I think he was probably a bit mad at me, but um, I redeemed myself this week and got a win. After a forgettable performance last week in Nashville in a fight with teammate Simon Pagno, Power held off Roman Grosjean on two late race restarts to get to victory, late, uh, to victory lane for the first time this IndyCar season. The win gives Power five wins on the 2.4-mile Indy road course and 40 total wins in the IndyCar series. From the Southern California Toyota Dealers Traffic Center, we make it easy. A crash on the 5 in Irvine. It's going to be on the southbound side, right at Toronto Parkway. That has only the carpool and the left lane open. Traffic is backing up to the 133. New Silmar on the five southbound to 405. Crash has the truck lane and the right lane shut down. 
Yeah, do the call and pass. 138 east to westbound F15, a big rig crash. That's all lanes blocked there. KFI in the sky helps get you there faster. I'm Jonathan White. Triple digit temperatures on the way next. I am one of thousands of women with metastatic breast cancer or MBC, which is breast cancer that has spread to other parts of the body. I am living in the moment and taking Ibrant Salpocytid. Ibrant's 125 milligram tablet with an aromatase inhibitor is for postmenopausal women or for men with HR positive HER2 negative MBC as the first hormonal based therapy. Be in your room. Ask your doctor about Ibrant and visit Ibrant.com. Ibrant may cause low white blood cell count that may lead to serious infections. Ibrant may cause severe inflammation of the lungs. Both of these can lead to death. Tell your doctor right away if you have new or worsening symptoms, including trouble breathing, shortness of breath, cough, or pain. Before taking Ibrant, tell your doctor if you have fever, chills, or other signs of infection, liver or kidney problems, are or plan to become pregnant, or are breastfeeding. Common side effects include low red blood cell and low platelet counts, infections, tiredness, nausea, sore mouth, abnormalities in liver blood tests, diarrhea, hair thinning or loss, vomiting, rash, and loss of appetite. Masks are coming off, seasonal allergies are on the rise, and COVID-19 is still out there. Sneezing, runny nose, cough, and fever can be allergy symptoms. There are also symptoms of COVID-19. If you have